Ephesians chapter number five. If you got it, say, I got it. If you need some more time, say, hold up. Uh, all right, well, go ahead. Keep turning. Uh, Ephesians, right after Galatians. Uh, here we go. Uh, I want you to uh, be aware that we are closing. We are closing this portion of the series called Thank You, Holy Spirit. I say that because I think we do these series. Let me explain to you how we teach and preach here at Freedom. It's not that uncommon. Other places do it as well. We, we, we teach and preach in series because there's a topic that God will lay on my heart or there's a topic that the church needs. There's a direction that we need to go in. And so we teach on it for several weeks at a time. Otherwise, I'd be here talking to y'all for six hours. Y'all can barely take the 45, 55 minutes that we do every week. I cannot sit here and do a teaching for six hours. It didn't be like Jesus when he's teaching the disciples and 5,000 people around. The disciples like, man, you a little long-winded, Jesus. Uh, the people getting hungry. Can you feed them? And Jesus like, you feed them. I'm teaching. You know, y'all, y'all miss those little subtleties. Jesus, Jesus is giving the business. But, but we teach in series so that we can, we can, we can stretch it out so that we can give uh, the information over time and that you can receive it. Uh, but I was thinking about this, you know, when you have a, a TV show that you like and it's a series, we always, as, a, as the body of Christ, like we conclude the series, like, this series is over. And I thought about it, I think I said it a couple years ago, I'm going to start saying we're going to conclude this season of the series because when you have a series, right? It's not until the series finale and it's like finally over. You have season one, season two, season three. And so when we're talking about the Holy Spirit, let me, let me tell you straight up, there is no way that we have exhausted the information or the vastness of the Holy Spirit in five weeks of time. I'm telling you right now, this is just season one. Right? And so after episode five or six or whatever number this is, I don't even know. After this, we'll, 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 we'll close this season out. And then in another season, we'll come back to this series and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the Holy Spirit even more. I, I wonder how we feel like we can master God in a weekend. I even have a problem with master's degrees, right? We call it a master of divinity. Who's mastering God? But that's a whole other thing. Here's the problem. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Uh, we're concluding this series, and today's message title is Thank You for the Filling. Thank you for the filling. F-I-L-L-I-N-G, not F-E-E-L-I-N-G. Uh, there are some of you who come into church, and we worship the Lord, and we're excited about what God is doing, and we thank him for the feeling. But when the feelings wear off, you need a filling to sustain you. When the feelings wear off, you need a feeling to sustain you. And so today, uh, the message title is actually a little bit preemptive. It, it is me saying, thank you, Holy Spirit, for the feeling. But, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this up front as you process what it is that I teach you today, as you process what it is that we go over through the scripture, as you process how I walk you through some important questions that you need to answer. Here's what I want you to be aware of. At the end of this message, I'm going to give you an opportunity to talk to God and receive the feeling of the Holy Spirit. This is a preemptive sermon title. So, so I'm saying thank you for the, for the filling because the Lord will give you what it is that you ask for as it relates to the filling of the Holy Spirit. But, but I want you to understand what it is that you're asking for. I want you to understand what it is that you're receiving. I want you to understand the importance of receiving the filling of the Holy Spirit. And if you're at home, I want you to lean in. If you're in this room, I want you to lean into this because there are so many of us who are confused about what the filling of the Holy Spirit is and why we need it. To, to be honest, uh, many believers are like how I was when I went to my cousin Drew's house in Louisiana years ago when I was a child. Uh, my mom will remember this story. We got to Louisiana, and uh, Drew's mom cooked some dressing. She cooked some dressing, and she had this entire spread for us, and she cooked this dressing, and, and there was something about the dressing that did not appeal to my eyes. What, what I smelled in the kitchen, what everybody described that was going to be this great meal was amazing. I was excited. Everybody else was excited. We were getting ready to throw down, and then when I got to that dressing, I looked at it, and there was something about the presentation of it that turned me off. And so the presentation of it turned me off. And they were like, no, nah, you don't understand. That's the best dressing you'll ever have in your life. But it was something about the way it was presented to me that made me say, nope, I'm going to stay away from it. Now, now, eventually, they convinced me that I need to take a spoonful. And when I took the spoonful of that dressing, I, I promise you, I probably ate half the pan by myself because it was that good. 
but it was something about the presentation that was throwing me off from something that was going to bless me. Y'all missed it. There was something about the presentation that was making me a little shy about taking a dive into something that was going to bless me. And because many of you have heard words like the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And when you see that, you see crazy charismatics and Pentecostals going off their handle and they're spooky and they're weird. You say, I don't want anything to do with that. Because you've seen, you've seen some of your Baptocostal friends catch the Holy Ghost like he's a football and he's dan- they're dancing and jiving and falling out on the floor. Now you're saying to yourself, I don't want anything to do with that. Because you've heard that the filling of the Holy Spirit will make you be in line at Kroger and when they're checking out, you might grab the mic, push the button and start speaking in tongues over the mic. You're afraid to be filled with the Spirit. Oh no, let's just be honest. When I say that I want you to be full of the Spirit of God, there are some weird things that go through your mind. When I say online that I want you to be full of the Spirit of God, you, you start to wonder, what is he going to do to me? You start to wonder, what is he going to make me say? How am I going to act? Am I going to be able to be normal again? You're like, I- I'm cool. With God, creator, I can acknowledge him. You know, if the stars were made to worship, so will I. And it's just so amazing because we know the creator God. And he's a wonderful God. And he creates galaxies upon galaxies upon galaxies. And he's an awesome God. Your scientific mind loves that God. And then you love the Savior. You love God the Son, Jesus. He walked in this world and he rebuked religious people for you. And you love that because you want a defender. You, you want somebody who comes alongside of you and makes sure that when other people don't understand you, there is somebody who covers you, who loves you, who forgives you, who blesses you. But that Holy Spirit, though, that, that Holy Spirit, though, I mean, just his name, right? We, we've just now gotten to the point where we're calling him the, 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 the Hagias Numa, the Holy Spirit. But we, we, we've been used to calling him the Holy Ghost. You don't nobody want to hang out with ghosts. We got a whole movie and series about ghost busters. Like, we want to get rid of ghosts. And now I'm telling you that you need one in your life. As a matter of fact, you, you, you need him more than you would ever know. And so today, I want to read for you a few verses in your hearing, give you some context, and jump into three questions that you need to answer uh, about this filling of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 through 21. I'm sorry, uh, uh, team back there. I think I gave you all 17. I'm going to start at 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Context. Look carefully then how you walk. Paul is writing to the Ephesian church about their relationship to one another and their relationship to God, this great inheritance that they have now that they become saints. He's talking about how they've come out of being darkness into being light. Paul is saying there's a newness on you and there's a new way that you ought to live. And I need you to look carefully then how you walk. And when you're walking, I need you to be wise. He says, I need you to take steps that are intentional toward this new life of freedom that God has called you to. Notice this, and I need to say this quickly, that there are some things that you are set free from, and there are some things that you are set free to. That freedom is not just something that releases you from something, but it also pushes you into something. There's a freedom from and a freedom to. And this is the freedom to that Paul is talking about. You're free to walk in wisdom. You're free to walk as wise and not as unwise. Look at verse 16. Making the best use of the time. Time wasters. (laughs) Here's a word for you. You need to make the best use of the time. Why? Because the days are evil. I I, I, I wonder about people who are silent saying that I'm playing this strategy because uh, over time things will change. Though The Bible says we need to make the best use of the time. The days are evil. We need to step up and be wise today. Verse 17, now you can follow along online and in the room if they got the scripture up there. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, this is the context of of this scripture that you guys have heard. I'm going to read the next one, and this is one that y'all know, but I want to give you the context. Paul says, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine. I lost five of y'all right now. 
Like this dude is trying to kill my turn up. Is that what this whole message series is about? He brought us all the way to the end to tell me not to have a drink. That's not what I'm talking about. And do not get drunk. Somebody say drunk. drunk. With wine, for that is debauchery. Y'all don't use that word, but that's it's excess to pleasure. It's hedonism. It's, it's only seeking stuff for you without sacrifice and thought for others. He says that leads to debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, and we'll come back to that. There's a contrast there. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Paul says th this is what it should look like when you're free to live in this kingdom that God has called you to. This, this is the picture of it. This, this is how it should look. And, and so I want to talk to you just going back to 18. He says, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. I'm going to ask you three questions. You need to answer them. You're going to ask yourself these questions as well. And we're going to answer them with a lot of sub points. Y'all got to take, y'all ready to take notes? If you're taking notes, write this down. If you're not taking notes... Here we go. First question, why is it important? Why is it important? The questions will be simple. I want you to follow along. Why is it important? Paul says, do not be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit of God, or be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul says, be filled with the Spirit. Why is it important? I was watching um, a few years ago, ESPN has these documentary series that several of y'all have watched before, 30 for 30. And one of the ones that I was watching was 30 for 30 Broke. And if you've ever seen 30 for 30 Broke, you know that most athletes, it is said, go broke, I think, two and a half to three years after their pro careers are over. And as I was watching this, they were talking to guys who had gone broke, and they talked about the illiteracy of some of the men financially who had made millions of dollars, but nobody taught them anything. One such man talked about how he was riding around in a car with a superstar on his team, and he went and he looked in the man's glove box, and the man had physical checks from the organization in his glove box, and he did not know to cash his checks. He did not know that every game check, when they handed him a physical check, that he had to go and deposit it in the bank. He did not know that that money that, was, that he had on these checks, it was his, but it was no good to him until he applied it. He, he didn't understand that he was driving around in, in a borrowed car because he got it on credit. He didn't realize that he was living in a borrowed house. All of this stuff that he could afford, but now he was in debt and enslaved and in bondage to someone else simply because nobody told him that what you have, if you apply, you can have everything that you ever desire. He's walking around with physical checks in his glove box, and he didn't deposit them. Until he deposited those checks, those checks were in his possession, but they did him no good until he applied it. Why is the filling of the Holy Spirit important? Because you get him when you get saved. He is handed to you like a game check to this particular athlete. Jesus says you now can receive the Holy Spirit. And when you are saved, the Bible says the Spirit comes and takes residence in your glove box, your heart. And for many of us, we've been living in debt to the lies of the enemy. We've been living in bondage to the things of our past. We've been living in a place where we are not living in complete freedom and destiny and purpose simply because we have not deposited what it is that we've received. And why is the filling of the Holy Spirit important? Because many of us are carrying around the greatest key to unlock everything that we need, but you have not learned how to deposit him into your life. Well, pastor, I got him. Yep, but that doesn't mean anything until you apply what it is that he has for you. You've got him, but does he have you? Paul writes to, the, to these Ephesians and he lets them know that when you receive Jesus, your eternity was changed. He says, he says, there is an internal change that happens when you receive Jesus. That is when you are baptized into the body of Christ. That is a spiritual phenomenon. Only God knows that there is an eternal change. Then you are water baptized. That is an external expression. But there is a point where you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That is an internal transformation that many of us need and have not done and have not received. Why? Because we don't understand the Spirit of God and what he wants to do in us. 
When Paul says that we ought to be filled with the Holy Spirit, this verb, be filled, is an imperative present passive verb. It's an imperative present passive verb. Y'all like, don't nerd out on me too much, pastor. I need you to get this, though, because this is powerful. There are three things that you need to understand about the importance of the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Spirit. Paul is not suggesting that you be filled with the Spirit. It's an imperative, which means it's commanded. It's commanded that Paul is saying that, that uh, I'm not giving you a suggestion. I'm not giving you some advice. I'm not telling you what you could do and what could be available to you. Paul is saying, no, I'm giving you a command. When you read the scripture, you need to look for the commands because the commands are what it is that God is looking to do in and through the life of the believer. And when God says that he wants you to be filled, he's literally saying, I've got something for you to do. And it will only happen if you allow the spirit of God to fill you. There's some of you who are trying to live out your plans and your purpose by your skill alone. And God says, no, the command is be filled. You're trying to live out what it is that God showed you or what he spoke to you. And you're saying, why am I stuck in this place? Because you haven't fulfilled the command. That everything God shown you was a preview of coming attractions so that you would get excited about going into the life that God has planned for you. But the command is, somebody say, be filled. You need to be filled. It's an imperative, but it also is a present verb, which means it's continual. It's commanded, but it's continual. You don't just get filled once and be done with it. Because you know some of y'all, I mean, I was in so-and-so Baptist church in 1999, and the Spirit was moving in that place. And they asked, if anybody wants to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you just release. And in 99, you got filled with the Spirit. And you said that was good enough. But the verb in the text is, and this is why I got to show you this because you're reading it too fast. You're reading it in English and you say, be filled with the Spirit as though it's a one-time event. No, the filling of the Spirit is a continual thing. It is a command that is continual, which means you need to seek the filling of the Spirit every single day. Day. When you wake up in the morning, you ought to say, thank you, Holy Spirit. Come and fill my heart. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Come and fill my mind. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Come and fill my mouth. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Come and fill my hands. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I need you today like I've never needed you before. It's a command, but it's also continual. It's, it's an imperative present passive. This is my favorite one. It's conditional. It's not automatic. It's, it's, not, it's not just going to happen. It's not just something that happens. Now watch this. Watch this. It is not you that does the filling. It is the spirit who does the filling. But you have to make yourself available to be acted upon. I got to say that again. It, it is not you that does the filling. It is the spirit. He fills you. He says, be filled. It's passive, which means you, you're, you're the agent to be filled but you're not the one doing the filling. You, you don't take yourself and go over to the spirit and say, well, I'm gonna go on and get under the spout of the spirit and I'm gonna get full because that's what some of us do. We use our worship services as a place where we feel empty and we run to the place and we try to get under the spout and we try to get full, but this is a passive thing. You've got to make yourself available to be acted on. And I don't care what position you find yourself in, if you're not truly available, and the only one that knows if you're available or not is the Holy Spirit of God. It is to make yourself available to be acted upon. I love this because this verb that Paul uses to be filled is also used throughout the New Testament. Kind of like, like, it's not like being filled with a cup. You know, we say be filled to the brim. You know, you get you a cup, you get under the spout. Once you fill it to the brim and it starts to spill over. You know, David talked about that kind of feeling. My cup runneth over. Hey, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. Y'all like that, that kind of feeling. That's not what this feeling is. This feeling is that Johnny Cochran feeling. Y'all like, what is he talking about? Yeah, this that feeling, this that feeling that looks more like Johnny Cochran is, is, is the late great Johnny Cochran is defending O.J. Simpson and he goes into the courtroom and he picks up a glove. And he says, he says, uh, uh, here's the glove that you all assume and allude that O.J. used in order to murder his dead wife. And then he begins to feel the glove with the hand of O.J. And he says, if it does not, you must now, I'm not getting on to the OJ thing. Y'all can argue that in the lobby afterwards. But I do want you to understand that that's the type of feeling that God is talking about. He says that the glove is useless until it's filled. Oh, Mr. Says, says that the, the glove is limp until it's filled. 
That the glove has no purpose until it's filled. That yes, you have the form. Watch this. We were made in the image of God and you're running around with the personality and the great talent and some skills and all of this. But none of it is no good, especially with an eternal purpose until it's filled with the hand of God. The other way that that is used in the New Testament, I'm just giving y'all some New Testament uh, uh, language so that you can understand what it means to be filled. Why is it important? I'm going to walk you through this. It is also used like a sail that is filled with wind. That's the reason why many of us have no direction in our lives because we're not filled. You're being tossed and driven by the waves and the waters of life. You're being tossed and driven. Matter of fact, in Ephesians chapter number four, he says that the reality is the saints need to be built up so that we're no longer tossed to and fro by the different doctrines and winds and waves. Here's the reason why. Some of us are driven by politics. Some of us are driven by conservative doctrines. Some of us are driven by what's happening on our jobs. Some of us are driven by our emotions. Some of us are driven by all of these things. But if we get full of the Holy Spirit, he can control our direction. He is the wind that gets into our sails. And no matter how choppy or rough the waters are, he can guide and direct you. The reason why I tell you it's a command, it's continual, and it's conditional is because I need you to understand how important it is for you to be connected and filled with the Holy Spirit. That many of us are missing out on the things that God has for us simply because we don't understand what it means to be filled. So now I need you to understand it's not optional. It's not a one-time thing, and it's not something that is automatic, but, but it is important. It's important because God has ordained it for you in order for you to live out what he's called you. So now let's have some fun. Here's question number two. What does it bring? What, what does the filling of the Holy Spirit bring? The Bible says that we ought to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I believe that being filled with the Holy Spirit is, is, is how God begins to express himself through you into the world. Uh, I wonder if there was anybody who's ever been around somebody who, who drank too much. You know, the text says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. This is not Paul telling you that you should not drink. This is Paul telling you this. Now, and now you need to understand context, too. He's speaking to the, to the church of Ephesus. These are people who were, uh, at one point, probably pagans who worshiped the goddess Diana. And when you go to the temple of Diana, they would get drunk. And, and, and once they got drunk, just all of the things that came out of their mouths and the things that they did, they considered that worship to the goddess Diana. The goddess Diana, or, or, or as her other name was, Aphrodite, they would, they would get in there and they would, have, they would have all kind of sexual encounters and they would, they would get drunk, they would get out of their mind, there would be aesthetic talk, all of these things would happen. So what Paul is speaking to them with, he's saying, he's saying this was your old way of worship when you used to get drunk and get out of your mind and be out of control and the wine would control how you acted and it would take you out of your senses. He says, I've got a new thing for you and it's the spirit of God to control you and to do something new with you. And I watch this. He's not talking about, because all the religious people are sitting there and they're like, yeah, I've been telling them boys they need to get that wine out their house. Oh, wine, oh, that's not what the text is saying. The text is telling us, though, that drunkenness is not the, pl the, the plan of God for your life. The Bible is saying that, that when you're controlled by any spirit other than the Holy Spirit, we got a problem. You ever notice when you go to the liquor store, they're selling wine and what spirit are you filling yourself with? intentionally filling yourself with another spirit other than the Holy Spirit is dangerous to you. Now, you just understand this. If you've ever been around somebody who drinks like, I'm talking about like a lot. Like I've been around some people who drink like a lot. So much so that when they ain't drinking, they smell like liquor. Because eventually, what they fill themselves up with starts coming out their pores. Because eventually, they're so full of it and so used to it and they're so continually full of this thing that eventually, even when they're not like full of it in that moment, you know that they were in the presence of whatever they drink because it comes out of their pores. They start sweating and they don't even sweat regular no more. They sweat, you know, 100, 100 proof. <laughs> <laughs> They don't even sweat like, you know, it's not, it's not, it's, 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 it's they're sweating the stuff that they're full of now. That, that, that now, you ever, let's not use alcohol because some of y'all are offended because you, you're getting scared now. You're sweating a little bit, it's warm in the room. And you're like, I don't want nobody to know what I drank last night. You ever been around a person that eats like a lot of garlic or certain foods? That, that, that they're porous foods, they, that you get full of them. And what happens is it, you cannot help but when you're around them to smell it because it starts to come out of them. 
I wonder if the believer could be accused of the same thing with the Spirit. That there, is, there is a point in my life that I am not there yet, but I want to get there to where I'm not on this platform. I'm not in a uniform. I'm not with a title. I'm with folk who don't know me, but it's like what the disciples were accused of in Acts chapter number four when they interviewed him. And they say, these men don't have any education, but we can tell they've been with Jesus. I wonder if there's anybody here who had a desire to be so full of the spirit that he comes out of your pores. That in the moment where you become angry about something, it is love that comes out of your pores because the fruit of the Spirit is love. I wonder if there's anybody who would get to the place where they got love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control coming out of your pores. Like you don't even have to think about it anymore. It's just who you are because you've been so continually full of the Spirit. Let me give you a few words or a few things that you get when you get the Holy Spirit. And these are the things that you ought to be examining your life against and seeing if this, if this is coming out of your pores. Number one, his person. When you're filled with the Spirit, you are filled with his person. That means the very character of God is in you. Y'all missed it. His person. The Holy Spirit is not an it the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit, when I say person, I remember years ago, I was teaching a growth track at our church, and we are teaching about the Holy Spirit, what we believe about the Holy Spirit. We believe that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. And there was a lady who was joining our church, older lady. I guess she grew up in a tradition that called the Holy Spirit an it and not a person. And so she emailed me and said to me, I can't believe you called the Holy Spirit a person. She was like, I know people. People are sinful. And if the Holy Spirit is a person, then a person is sinful. And you're saying that the Holy Spirit is sinful. And my answer that I gave her was, is we don't define God according to our characteristics. We're supposed to define ourselves against who God is. And the fact that I'm a person made in the image of God means that the very definition of personhood comes from his personality. The very definition of personhood comes from God. Don't ever forget that. We don't, we don't use the term that God is a person and we use it in comparison to people you know. No, you understand that you're a person with a personality, with a will, and all these things because God has it. The fact that, that, that God made man in his image, formed him in the garden. In Genesis 2, 7, the Bible says that he does not become a living soul or a person until God breathes the breath of life into him. You're no person without God. So don't try to reduce God to not being a person. So when we talk about the Holy Spirit and him coming to live on the inside of you, Romans 8 and 9 says that if you belong to Christ, you also have the spirit of him on the inside of you. You now have the person of God on the inside of you. The very character of God is in you. The, 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 very, the very personality of God is in you. I just named off the fruit of the spirit at least nine characteristics that you should be known for if the person of God is on the inside of you. Or is the person of God pouring out of your pores? Is the person of God, is the person of God, you feel with the Holy Spirit, is the person of God now presenting to, to other people himself through you? The, the Holy Spirit is personal, but yet you say, I love Jesus, I don't love people. Well, you're not filled with the Spirit. No, I'm not saying you're not saved, but you don't love people, you're not filled with the Spirit. You, you don't want to be around God's people. You don't want to be in, in, in communion with the people in the congregation of the saints when the text says that this is the place that we get together to experience him together and we worship him together. You don't want to do that. That's a sign that you may not be filled with the Spirit. Well, what happens when the Spirit comes? Number one, you get his person. The other thing is you get his presence. This, this, this is the beauty of it right here, right? Because the presence of God now is with you wherever you go. The, the, the presence of God is with you in whatever you do. The presence of God is with you. And here's the one thing that I need somebody to understand, that when the Bible teaches us that he will never leave us nor forsake us, what is he telling us? He's telling us that it's the spirit who is with us. And when you're full of his spirit, you are full of his presence. That means that the presence of God is always with you. How lonely are you right now? That, that I know there are some people who are starving and longing for companionship. And the Spirit of God is saying, just let me fill you. Yeah. 
If you would allow me to fill you in this season of your life, I promise you, it does not mean he's going to take away your desire for companionship with friends or a spouse or anything like that. But you will be content in the presence of God until he fulfills the, 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 the desire that you have for companionship with others. God is telling me to tell you that when you're full of the spirit, you are full of his presence. Now, this, this, this is important. This is important because I've taught you before that we are kings and queens unto our God, that God is king of kings. This is, uh, y'all don't ever forget this. Y'all are quiet like you don't remember it. You are, God is king of kings, which means God, God reigns over kings. And if God gave you dominion over the earth, dominion, kingdom, is a king's domain. God gave you dominion over the earth, which means you are to reign and rule here. But you don't reign and rule under your own authority. You are a king, Adrian, under a king. That God is king and he places you in rule and authority. Now watch this. Because he gives his presence to you, this is how the demonic forces recognize who it is that you are and have to bow down when you come through. If you're not full of the spirit and you're trying to reign without the spirit, you, you, seven sons of Sceva. I don't know have to go back to that. Those dudes got whipped and beaten. I, I don't want to have to go back to that, but let me talk to you. We talked about that earlier in this, se this series. I need you to see, though, that the presence of God is what gives you the authority of God. That the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life gives you God's authority. That you can move through this world with authority and dominion simply because you have this presence of God on you. All right, let's go to the next one. It's also his power. Now, let's keep on this kingdom theme. Here, here's the reality. That, that if I... Ooh, uh, I, I, was, I was studying this. If I were living in the realm of the king and I'm the son of the king, what is my title? Somebody online type it in chat. If I was living in the realm of the king and I'm the son of the king, what is my title? Prince. Oh, this is going to be good when I tell it to you. I, I'm a prince. So I'm a prince. I live in the realm of the king. And the reason why is because I can never be king until the king dies. And so, and so in order for God to be king of kings, he has to give his son a new territory to reign in. Y'all go get it in a minute. That in order for God to say that he's king of kings and to give you dominion, he has to give you a territory to reign in. You don't get to reign in heaven. That's his turf. You, you don't get to reign in heaven. That's God's territory. But God says in the beginning, I'll create the heaven's and the earth. And, and as I form the earth and as I form this vast place of, 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 of reflection of what my creativity and my goodness is, I want to create man in my image and in my likeness. I want him and her to have authority and dominion. And because they can't reign as kings and queens in my dominion, I'm going to give them authority and power in the earth. The problem is God opts into man in Genesis chapter number two. In Genesis chapter number three, we opt out of God. Y'all missed it. Oh, I don't have enough time. In Genesis chapter number two, God opts into man. He breathes into man his presence and his power. So now, watch this. Adam, the first man, has authority, Austin, to live as king in the earth because he has daddy's authority delegated. Uh, I, know, I know for a group of mainly African-American people, you start talking about colonizing and it starts wrecking your whole brain. But the reality is people can pervert a good thing. It is, it is, it is, not, it is, not, it is not the strategy of colonization that is the problem. It is the motive of the colonizer that is the problem. <laughs> I got to say that again. It is not the strategy of colonization that is the problem. It is the motive of the colonizer that is the problem. And what God said was, watch, I'm going to give you my person. Y'all, I'm, I'm, I'm slow, but I'm worth waiting on. I'm going to give you my person, which gives you my character. I'm going to give you my presence, which gives you my authority. And I'm going to give you my power, which means you can reign wherever it is that you go. But if you go without his person, you'll strategize. I mean, you'll use the strategy in the wrong way. Here's what God has called you to. I got to walk this slow because I got to teach this. I don't want to preach it. I don't need you to shout. I need you to get this. Watch. That God now delegates to you authority on the earth. 
that this is the territory in which you reign as kings and queens. This is the territory in which you have authority. This is the territory in which God gives you kingdom delegation. Watch this. That what God said was, listen, I reign in heaven, but because I'm eternal, I can't die, you will never be king. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a territory to reign in. And what happens is we have this territory to reign in that God has given us. And here's what God literally says. God says, hey, as long as you got my presence, the earth will recognize. Remember last week when we talked about the prodigal son, that he put a ring on his finger and the ring represented authority. And wherever he showed the ring, it showed that he could go where the daddy told him he could go. And God says that's what the spirit of God does on the inside of you. When you walk through the earth and you begin to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you've got the power of God with you and you reign as kings listen I need you to see this that what happens with the king is go study throughout history Go study throughout history. I believe it was Portugal and Brazil, Portugal and Brazil, that the Portuguese uh, king said that his son was, was, was coming to a place where he was maturing, he was becoming a warrior, all of these things, and he could see that his son needed to be king. And so what he did was he sent his son to Brazil, and that became a territory of the kingdom of Portugal ruled by his son. Y'all missed it. It was a territory of the kingdom far away ruled by the son. Can I tell you that when God fills you with his spirit and he gives you education as a territory... It's supposed to be a territory of the kingdom far away, but that is enacted here on earth. When God gives you the territory of entertainment or music, he gives you that territory to rule, to reflect what it is that you're supposed to be doing on the earth. God has given you territory. Now, can I tell you in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, because we got people who are perverting this now. They're taking land and they're killing people because they're saying, I'm taking territory for the Lord. This is happening. I got to be honest because there's some of y'all that are wondering in your mind, you can't focus on what I'm saying because you're seeing the evil done by the, the motive of the colonizer. Here's the territory that God has taken over in the New Testament. The territory that God has taken over are the hearts of people. The territory that God is coming for in the New Testament are the hearts of people. And what, what he wants to do is he wants us to be, watch this, I got, this is why it says thank you for the feeling. He wants us to be filled with his spirit which gives us his person, his presence, his power, so that when we move, people begin to see, wait, what is that that you have? And we say, hi, I'm ruled by a different king. I got, I got a different governor, Miles Monroe would say. I got a different governor who governs my life. Watch this. And what he begins to do, what you begin to do is you begin to share the gospel or you begin to evangelize, share the good news of how the Lord has now taken over your territory and how his person and his presence and his power have changed your life. And you know what they want to do? Listen, how can I get what it is that you have? Evangelism is not knocking on doors and telling people it can be that, but it's not just that. It's not just knocking on doors and telling people they'll go to hell if they don't receive Jesus. Evangelism is living the life of purpose that God has called you to so that Folk will inquire about the Jesus who changed your life by the power of the Holy Spirit. What does it bring? It brings his person, it brings his presence, it brings his power, it brings his provision. I'm telling you about being a, a child of the king. Here's the beautiful thing about this. And you go back and read Ephesians. Paul uses this term, the will of God, over and over and over again in this text. In the book of Ephesians, he talks about the will of God so much, Felicia, that it's crazy. He talks about the mysterious will of God. He couples that with talking about the inheritance of the saints. Yeah. So you need to understand that when you have the, you're full of the Spirit, you have the ability, watch this, to not only uh, be provided for by God, but you're in the will and the trust. Y'all yeah. understand what a trust is? Y'all you, 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 you wish you were. Some of you going gonna, gonna, you gonna, you gonna to blow up and your kids will be this. The trust fund baby. You heard about the trust fund baby. The trust fund baby is the person that the parent has provided so much for them that the parent says, listen, I got a trustee. And the trustee is going to handle the affairs for my child. And as they make certain progress and as they make certain strides in life, there are certain levels of the trust that is released to them. There are certain things that are given to them as they reach certain milestones, that there, there, is, there is a certain age and then they get so much money. There is a certain thing. They may have to go to school and get the degree, then they get so much money. Then after they get married, they get so much. And they're being released according to these milestones because the will and the trust say, 
say that this is how the provision is to be laid out. The reason why I'm following God in the next season of my life is not out of obligation. It's because of the will and the trust. And you don't understand how to under, you don't, you don't understand fully what it is that God has for you. If you don't understand fully what God has for you, you'll begin to live any kind of way. And then you wonder why the provision is not there. He says, I release provision to those who are in the will and that can handle the trust. I missed it. And the Holy Spirit of God is the custodian and the guardian of the trust. Here's what he's doing with you. When you're full of the Spirit of God, here's why he brings his provision. Because he begins to speak to you. And he says to you, Shana Lee, uh, here's the next move that you need to make. And if you're obedient, he says, that's another level of the trust. Here's the question. Can God trust you? <laughs> Can he trust you? When the Spirit of God speaks to you and says, hey, I need you to go and speak to this person about this. And then the Lord says, she did it. I can trust her. And there's a level of the trust that is released. Y'all missed it. There's a level of trust that's released. Inherent in the trust is the provision. Inherent in the trust. Inherent. Inherent. Y'all don't understand that in the trust of God is where he releases the inheritance. In the trust of God, in the will of God is where he releases the provision. I obey God not out of obligation, out of opportunity to be released into the trust. What, what does it bring? I want you to be filled with the Spirit. I want you to be filled with the Spirit. Because when you're filled with the Spirit, you get his person, his presence, his power, and his provision. Here's the last thing, and we're, we're out of here. Y'all ready? This is the practical piece. Question number one, why is it important? It's a command, it's continual, it's conditional. Question number two, what does it bring? It brings his person, his presence, his power, his provision. Question number three, how, how do I get it? How, how do I get it? Because oftentimes in church, we'll, we'll talk to you about what it is that God wants for you, why it is that he wants it, what the importance of it is, what you can have if you get it, and then you're stuck between Sunday and Sunday figuring out, how do I get this? How, how do I, you said it's passive, Pastor. It's passive. It's, 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 it's not, it's, it's, it's conditional. I have to receive it. I have to make myself available to be acted upon. How do I get it then? Here it is. Write these things down, and we're going to look at a few scriptures. First thing is, remove all the barriers. R remove all the barriers. Here's, here's barrier number one. Your logical explanation of what it is that you believe God is supposed to be doing in your life. You, you need to remove all of the, all of the barriers. You, you need to remove all the barriers and say, Lord, whatever it is that you have for me, I want it. If that means, watch this, because you're so scared that you're going to be on aisle seven. You're talking about the aisles again. You're going to be on aisle seven, speaking in tongues. Maybe. I'm not saying this is what God is going to do, but what if it is? Ultimately, you've got to begin to trust that whatever it is that God has for you is what's best for you. Even if it makes you look like someone you didn't want to look like. Even if it makes you have to sacrifice what it is. Listen, you've got to begin to trust that what God has for me is what's best for me. Here's what you can't do. You can't receive the filling of the Holy Spirit today saying, God, I want all of you. Just don't make me look like. God says, then you're not ready. How do I get it? Not like that. Not like that. We, we've got to get out of this place and position where we begin to tell God how he's supposed to move in our lives. We've got to get out of this place where we've seen things abused and we've seen things taken advantage of. And we're saying to ourselves, I will do it as long as you don't. And God is saying, I can't fill you with that. You still got compartments of your life that you won't let me. Listen, the whole thing of filling is that he takes every crevice and every corner of your life and he fills it with his spirit. Here's the problem. If you got areas that you're telling God he can't touch, how are you going to be filled? There's some of you who, <laughs> thank you, Holy Spirit. There's some of you who are wet and saturated because you've been in the presence of God, but you ain't filled. Because you got blockades. You got certain doors that you will not open to the Lord. You got certain places that you will not allow him to come in. Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39. I got to read the scripture because I just keep talking. Here's what it says. Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39. And Peter said to them, no, 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 let me back up. I, 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 again, I didn't give you all enough scripture. 37. Now, when they heard this, 
This is the message that Peter preaches on Pentecost when the Holy Spirit is upon Peter. The same Peter, same Peter who couldn't stand up to a little girl and denies Jesus is now preaching to the people who crucified Jesus and will one day uh, uh, crucify him upside down. He preaches to them with boldness. The word of God tell them, you killed the Lord. and You're going to be held accountable for it, but there's some help for you. And so they listen, they hear it, and they say, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sin, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, before I move on to verse 39, I want you to see what he says. Repent. Y'all say, well, how does that mean remove all barriers? You need to remove all barriers. Repentance is changing your thinking. Your thinking is so limited. Your thinking is, 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 is boxing God in to a place where he can't move. If you say you repented, but you've held on to things, listen, repentance means God is God and I'm not. Re- repentance means he can do what he wants to do in my life, and it does not matter what it costs me. It does not matter what they call me. It does not matter where it takes me. Repentance means God is God and I'm not. Here's what he says. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will. Somebody say will. will. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's how you get it. For the promise, watch this, is for you and for your children. Watch. And for all who are afar off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Notice this, this this filling of the Spirit is not for a select few holy people. It is not for the people who are on platforms who sing and preach. It is not just for those who have spent their time fasting and praying and laying in the corner. It is for everyone who God calls who will repent and receive the gift that God has given them. How do I get it, Pastor? Remove the barriers. Like today, tear down the walls in your mind that make you believe that there is something that God is going to do in your life that's going to make you like, well, what if he makes me speak in tongues? What if he does? Well, what if he makes me go and and confess some sin that I thought it was going to be secret for the rest of my life? What if he does? What if, what, what if he challenges me to become a witness and to begin to share with my coworkers? What if he does? Because with that person and presence comes power and provision. What are you forfeiting by not changing? You, you need to remove all the barriers. What are your thoughts? What are your sins? What are your issues? What are your, your, what are your, your limitations? The next thing you need to do is you need to request this gift. You need to remove the barriers. Now, now, for those of you who are prideful, you'll be like, well, I, I removed the barriers and the Lord didn't show up. No, you got to ask for it. Luke 11 and 13 says, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit? Wait, before I finish the verse. He says, he's a good gift. He's a good giver. He's a good father. He, he's going to give you what it is that you ask for when it's in accordance to his will. He's going to give you what it is. I'm going to say this again because this is a powerful point for the believers to understand. He's going to give you what it is that you ask for when it's in accordance with his will. And here's what he says in the text. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children. I know me. I give good gifts to my kids, sometimes at the detriment of the budget. He says, how much more Will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? I'm going to close this message in a minute. It's going to be a very practical piece. For those of you who are online, I need you to stay with me because this is the moment of truth for all of us. That we've been wanting the power and the provision and the presence and and, and, and the person of the Holy Spirit. We've been wanting God to move in our lives. When did you ask? Like when did you ask God to fill you? When did you ask God to come in and take over? When did you ask? We didn't ask because we, we had barriers up and we had a thought process of what that looked like. And I know for some of you, if this is your first time, I don't do this every week, but, but today we're going to spend some time asking the Holy Spirit to come. He says, how much more by those who ask? And here's the, here's the last one. Here's the last one. How do I get it? Release him by faith. Release him by faith. Go backwards a little bit further in your Bible. Go to Ezekiel. Go to Ezekiel chapter number 47 show you something. It's blessed me. 
uh, when I was in the series um, WTF, and I was reading in Ezekiel 37, there was a scripture that came up about the tree of life. It's a scripture that comes up about the tree of life in here, but if you go back and you get the context, Ezekiel chapter 47, oh I'm in 37, 37 are the dry bones. Y'all don't know about that. Verse chapter 47, verse 3, Ezekiel is in the temple. God is getting ready to show him a vision. He's going to show him a vision of life and, and how freedom and life is supposed to be. And God gives Ezekiel this vision. And in Ezekiel chapter 47, verse 3, it says, going on eastward. Now, if you know anything about Ezekiel, God will plant Ezekiel in these visions, and it seems so real to him. This is all that Ezekiel can experience, right? The wheel in the middle of the wheel, the valley of the dry bones, these other places. He's placed in the middle of this vision. And so now this becomes very real to him, and Ezekiel is getting a picture of something that God wants to show him. Here's what it says, going on eastward with a measuring line in his hand. There's a man that's guiding Ezekiel. The man measured out a thousand cubits and led me through the water, and it was ankle deep. That's how some of y'all come to church. That the Holy Spirit of God has led you to the water, a thousand cubits, and you came up, and you got ankle deep. Praise God, you got saved. Praise God. You got salvation. Praise God. The Lord led you into the waters and you're there and it's ankle deep. And here's the problem. The problem is that you're in the water, but you won't allow it to get over you. I need you to release him by faith. This is what I'm going to show you this in a minute. He says, he says, he says, it's ankle deep. There are some of you who've been saved for years and you haven't grown at all. And it's not, it's not an indictment on you. you. You're just like me. When I go to the beach, listen, I was telling some friends the other day, I don't want to die two ways. I don't want to burn to death, and I don't want to drown. You know why I first got saved, Tatiana? Because they said, if I don't accept Jesus, I'm going to burn. I was like, well, (laughs) me and the Lord, we good. (laughs) Since then, I've changed my mind. But I just wanted out of the fire. And another way I didn't want to die, I didn't want to drown. So for me, when I go to the beach, there's a little bit of trepidation as to how far I go in. Because if you've ever been in the beach, you understand that the further you go, there's an unexpected drop. But if I can stay where the ankles are cool, I can be refreshed, I can have fun, I can make sand castles, I can have a good time. That's how some of us come to church. We can sing our song, we can hear our message, we can get our ankles wet, and we can just have a little good time. And he led, but watch this, you were led to that point. Now, ain't nothing wrong with it. You were led to that point. No one can come to the Father unless he first be drawn. You were led to this point. But watch the text, look at verse 4. Again, he measured... A thousand and led me through the water, and it was knee deep. Oh, that's some of y'all. Y'all done got in a group. You done served on a team. You done told the world, I go to Freedom Church. Matter of fact, you even bold enough that on Saturday night, you'd be like, join us at 10 a.m. Online or in person. Welcome home, Freedom. You knee deep. That, that now you're a little more comfortable. You've gone into the depths of the fact that you got a devotional. You got a quiet time. You, 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 listen, you got your religion down. I'm way over my time, but it's too good. I can't stop. You got your religion down. Like you understand what it looks like. Matter of fact, even so much so that your religion is actually what Karl Marx talked about. It is the opiate to your soul. It is that thing that you do to make yourself feel good. It has not yet transformed you because it's only knee deep. It's knee deep. Here's the reason why I say it has not yet transformed you. It makes you feel good from the knees down. It makes others see. Because see the ankle deep, they can see all of you. They still haven't seen it yet. The knee deep, they can still say, hey, did you see her touch in that water? The knee deep, they can actually see it now. And you got your religion down. It feels good because folk recognize your boldness that you feel good about where you are, that you have now stepped out on faith. You were ankle deep. You stepped out on faith now. You're in deeper waters. Matter of fact, you like deeper messages now. You can snorkel in this water. (laughs) Problem is, you're still in control. So in the moment where the waves get big, you, you're really religious, and you can say the things, to, the right stuff to other people because your knees are wet, and they're, they're, they're still on the sand. You can talk to them. Matter of fact, you can splash water on them. But when the waves get too big, you, 
You back out because you're knee deep. Here we go. Verse, verse 5 says, again, he measured. Verse 4, 1,000, he led me through the water, and it was knee deep. Again, he measured 1,000, and led me through the water, and it was waist deep. Oh, you went to freedom class. You, you, you heard the word that God has a purpose for your life. You waist deep now. You win this thing. You fasted 21 days at the beginning of the year. All day Wednesday, you pray. And you in there, waist deep. But don't tell the Lord. I mean, don't let the Lord tell you that it's time for you to do something that is so ridiculously crazy that you're like, God, that don't line up with my five-year plan. God, that, that's not what I wrote down. God, that's not what I'm doing. And I, I'm not knocking any of this. Every single one of these was a place of invitation by the man God sent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm probably, if, you, if you're following me, thank you. If you're not, Holy Spirit, please correct it later or fix it. The person drew them out a thousand at a time, a thousand at a time, a thousand at a time. I'm not mad at where you are. I'm mad at where you're not willing to go. Can I say that again? I ain't tripping on where you are. Where you are is where, this is what I said this from the time we started this church. I want this church to have a shallow end and a deep end. I want you to understand that the Holy Spirit wants to fill you and I want you to also understand that Jesus forgives you. I want you to understand all of that. I'm not upset about where you, where you are. I'm upset about where you refuse to go. And I'm not upset with you. I'm upset with what it is that you're forfeiting. I'm looking into the horizon and I'm seeing what it is that God wants to do. I'm seeing how it is that God wants to bless your life. Here's what the text says. Again, he measured a thousand and it was a river. Somebody say river. River. That could not, I could not pass through for the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim in. A river that could not be passed through. And he said to me, son of man, have you seen this? I'm asking you, daughter of God, have you seen this? There's a river that is so deep that you can't pass through. The water has to carry you. There's a river that is so deep that you can't walk in it. The water has to carry you. And I'm telling some of you today that what God wants for your life is not ankle-deep Christianity. He doesn't want knee-deep Christianity. He doesn't want waist-deep Christianity. He wants the Spirit of God to overwhelm you, fill you, and carry you through to a life that he's propelled for you. Verse 7 says, as I went back, I saw on the bank of the river very many trees on the one side and on the other. And he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down to the Arba and enters the sea. When the water flows into the sea, the water will become fresh. Notice this. This is the reason why our religion gets stale. Because if you ain't in the place where the water flows into the depths of the sea, the water ain't fresh there. It's stale and it's, it's, it's overdone. Then he said this water, uh, this, verse 9, and wherever the river goes, this is why you got to flow. He says, I, I want you to, I want to fill you with the spirit. And this is what the text says in New Testament. When Jesus is talking to that woman who is at the well, he says, I want you to flow rivers. R rivers of living water are going to flow out of you. This is what he was describing. That what he was talking about was the spirit of God. I got to close the series. I know I'm taking a long time to get here, but this is what he was talking about. He was talking about these rivers right here. This is what the spirit is going to do. It's going to give you a fresh view. And wherever the river goes, wherever the river goes, wherever the river goes, wherever the river goes, wherever the spirit is, where the spirit of the Lord is, where the spirit of the Lord is, where the spirit of the Lord is, every living creature that swarms will lit. Every living creature, re write this down, go back and read it later. And wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live and there will be very many fish. That's called provision. For this water goes there and the waters of the sea may become fresh. So everything will live where the river goes. Everything will live where the river goes. How do I get the spirit? Release him by faith. I want you to remove your barriers. Man, we're done. Remove your barriers. Remove your barriers. What are your barriers? What, what are your barriers? Like, what is, that, what is that thing that is causing you to say, like, well, I would, but request the gift. Stand on your feet right now. And for those of you who are in the room right now who are saying, man, I don't know why he's so passionate about it, but I want that. Yes. Uh, those of you who are online, I don't know what you're thinking right now, but for those of you who are thinking, I want that. I want the Holy Spirit. I want the Holy Spirit in my life. I need you to ask today. The prayer team is going to be up here for the rest of this, this service. They're, we're going to have a, a, a transition at the end. But, but, but in this moment right here, this is how we're closing out this service. In this moment right here, 
This moment is for you to request and say, God, you said that if I asked, you'd give me the Holy Spirit. I know that I received him as the seal for my salvation. What does that mean? That means that when you get to heaven and when, when, when your time is, has come, then the Lord is going to look at you and he's going to know that you're his by the seal of the Holy Spirit. But, 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 but your eternity and your earth have two different pictures and purposes here. That in your eternity you've been sealed, but in your earth now you need some power. You, you need revelation. You need the ability, watch this, Whatever it is that is drawing and driving you is, is what you're going to keep going back to. Paul says, don't be drunk with wine. You know why people go to the alcohol? Because life, the Bible says, Jesus says this, in this life, you will have trouble. And what that alcohol does is it anesthetizes me. It numbs me for a while. And when it wears off, I got to go back and get more of it. When it wears off, I got to go get more food. When it wears off, I need more money. When it wears off, I need more sex. God says, I got something for you that's better than all of that. It's the Spirit of God. And here's what he says. I'm offering it to you today. But I need you to ask. So for those of you who are in the room who are saying, I think I want the Spirit of God. I, I want the Spirit of God. Not, not just as the seal for my salvation, but I want the Spirit of God to fill me. Those of you online. Here's what I want you to do. Right in your living room, right, right in this room. Just lift your hands. Lift your hands. It's the first barrier to remove. Because, <laughs> you know, some of us are thinking like, well, what is he going to do next? Remove all barriers. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to begin to speak to your Heavenly Father. And I want you to begin to request that he fill you with the Spirit. You do it in your terms. You do it in your way. I'm not going to give you knee-deep religion. I want you to be overtaken in the river of the flow of the life that the Holy Spirit wants for you. You just Now listen, open up your mouth and begin to request it. Hot Father, in the name of Jesus, fill me with your spirit. I need your spirit. I cannot make it without your spirit. God, if your spirit does not fill me, I cannot go on. God, I need you. Give me a fresh filling, a fresh anointing, a fresh flow of your spirit. God, remove my addictions. Remove my anxieties. Remove my fears. Remove my inconsistencies. God, in the name of Jesus, I need you. I'm requesting that you fill me with the gift, the power, the person, the provision. The, the person of the Holy Spirit right now. Open up your mouth and begin to request Him. Begin to request Him. Begin to request Him. Some of you, that's your barrier. That's your barrier. That's your barrier. Remove your barrier. Request the Holy Spirit. Remove your barrier. Remove your barrier. By faith, release him. Release him by faith. What does that look like? I don't know. But there are some of you, there's something in your spirit. You, you may have a song. You may need to shout. You may need to cry. You may need to lay down in front of your chair. You may need to, to make a move in your living room. Whatever it is, release him right now. You need to remove the barriers, request the gift, and release him by faith. Let the spirit do his work right now. Let the spirit do his work right now. Let the spirit do his work right now. Let It's, it's coming up over your ankles. It's coming up over your knees. It's coming up over your waist. He's getting ready to overflow you. He's getting ready to overflow you. I know there's somebody in here who's just releasing right now. Let's receive what God has for us. Let's receive what God has for us. Let's receive what God has for us. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Fall fresh on us. We need your presence, your kingdom come, your will be done, here as in heaven, Spirit of God, fall fresh on us, we need your presence your king 
kingdom come, your will be done here as in heaven. Spirit of God, fall fresh on me. I need your presence. Your kingdom come, your will be done here as in heaven. God, we ask again that you will fill this place with your presence, that you will move on your people. And those who need the fresh feeling of your spirit will receive it today. And this will be a marker of their commanded, continual, and conditional feeling. They will move forward in this from now until the day you called them home. God, we honor you. We thank you. We bless you. In Jesus' name.